an increase in what by what? Do I remember? Or if it's if they have a response to a bronchodilator, how do we know? They have a greater percentage of bronchodilators. Or is it? FBC one we've got or FBC and or FBC we've got. Good. So something that tells us kind of the volume. Right. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So how do we shut them down in order to increase them by twelve percent? Is bronchial provocation, and that's what we're about, we're talking about today. So um, so anyway, so that test PFT test will be Thursday. Um, we're going to finish up. I have test for. Chapter 14, Respiratory Monitoring, I have that down for the 15th. All right. The critical care monitoring, just in case you want to come back there. On the 15th? Uh, chapter 14. Yeah. Respiratory Monitoring Chapter. I have a worksheet for you guys today that I'll hand out that'll be due on the 15th. Um, and it'll cover all the math and all the things that will be on this test in addition to waveforms, which we're going to start today in a little bit. So just so you can have that up on all when that test is going to be. All right. So PFT test, well, Neo PFT test Thursday at 8. PFT test after that. Then we'll do critical care monitoring, talking about technography and things like that. Um, and then the next week on the 13th, We'll finish up any math, any questions you have over that, and we'll start EKGs. So, get ready for that. All right. Okay. Are the that test is good. diagnostic tests like this multiple choice or the one blank? The PFTs? And then, like, it's all of it. All of it? Yeah, there'll be a math sheet on the back, all the normal math stuff, um, and then there'll be multiple choice. I think it's mostly multiple choice, but I think there's a few from the blank. So mostly interstitial lung diseases are going to be low, excluding pulmonary hemorrhage and polycythemia. That's not a lung disease, but it's a condition. Um, and our airway diseases are obstructive diseases generally. Asthma and chronic bronchitis normal. Bronchiectasis is low, and I'm not really sure unless they're talking about bronchiectasis with a lot of lung obstruction. Um, but generally, if you generally we're trying to determine if our patient had emphysema or bronchiectasis. Um, so generally, we see it low with emphysema, not necessarily bronchiectasis. Right. Unless, our, I guess, in this case, they're talking about our bronchiectasis has a lot of lung obstruction with it. So why is emphysema low on DLCO? Um, because of the uh, decreased surface area. We got decreased surface area, right? Instead of a bunch of little alveoli, mm -hmm. we got a bunch of labs, right? Good. So that's why the only reason I think they, they maybe have bronchiectasis in there as well. Bronchiectasis is so destructive to the lungs as well. So they're including that decreased surface area in that grouping is my own, is what I think. Um, so anyway, uh, otherwise restrictive is low. A couple of places where we might see it high. Why do you think pneumonectomy, lobectomy would be low? Because we're missing. Right, this is a part of decreased surface area, right? So not going to suck as much carbon monoxide across the membrane as you would think. Very good. Okay, 
um, this is just kind of going back to doing our interpretation. Um, our asthma patients, they have low FEV1 and their FEV 25 to 75 is usually decreased, which gives them a scoop a little bit. Uh, normally, a normal total lung capacity, unless they're really hyperinflated, normal uh, diffusion, uh, but they do have a response to bronchodilator. Emphysema, on the other hand, looks kind of similar. Low FEV1, FEV 25 75 is decreased. Normal TLC, potentially a large TLC if they're really in a stage. Uh, emphysema, low diffusion, right? No response to bronchodilator. So our asthma patients respond to bronchodilator. Bronchiectis, chronic bronchitis somewhat. Emphysema usually doesn't very well. Do we give them breathing treatments at the hospital all the time? Yep, just in hopes that they might feel a little bit better and maybe it helps a little bit. Um, maybe they have a small response to bronchodilator, but not greater than 12% increase. Um, pulmonary fibrosis, <clears throat> which is kind of all of the restrictive groups, they kind of all look similar, right? Uh, low force vital capacity, so their capacity is low. A low FEV1, but a normal ratio, right? Because FEC is low and FEV1 is low, our ratio comes up greater than 70%. Uh, they usually have a small TLC, so comparing those TLCs helps. Um, they have a low diffusion, no response to bronchodilator. So these are some things that when you're looking to try to figure out what's wrong with your patient, uh, this kind of helps lay it out as far as what you're looking for. And I think the case studies, if you kind of work through those, they cover all of this really pretty well. Okay, so you'll see some case studies on there as well. And this kind of helps us. Okay, static lung volumes, we did this the other day. This is just talking about um, uh, helium, dilution, helium dilution, nitrogen washout, body box, we went over all of these on this. So this gives you our normal on our DLCO, 80 to 120 percent. Um, we said less than 65 is definitely significant. Um, if we're measuring in millimeters of mercury, normal is about 25, which just doesn't give us a percentage. Um, okay, so things that are going to affect that DLCO, we already talked about this. Surface area is a big one. Thickness of the membrane. So our ARDS patients, they've got those hyaline membranes developed. Those are going to have a thick membrane. So your DLCO will be low on that. Uh, fibrotic lung disease, they've got fibrotic changes in the lungs, also increases the thickness. Uh, that's why your fibrotic lung diseases are going to be low. Uh, hemoglobin and blood flow in the capillaries, they don't have enough hemoglobin to pick it up. Number one, we said we need a hemoglobin level. Looking for polycythemia, so that they're thinking maybe it would be um, too high to, to not be accurate. But also, if your hemoglobin is really low, it's not going to pick up carbon monoxide very well. So we need a hemoglobin number for both sides of it, right? Extremely high or extremely low. Um, and then match, matching and ventilation and perfusion. If our, we don't have big, good VQ uh, or we have a mismatch of VQ, uh, then our DLCO may be off as well. So um, kind of depends on what's wrong with your patient, but that kind of gives us some, some reasons we might see that being off. <clears throat> okay, we talked about resistance and compliance, right? Um, do you remember our formulas for resistance and compliance? Let me see if I wrote it down. Yes. I don't know if I have to do Resistance has to do with flow on the bottom right, which is. Did you say there was going to be math on this test? Not, not a lot, and there might be a little bit, but not. It's really, really, this math is going to be for chapter 14. Um, but yeah, static compliance is plateau minus P. Time volume divided by plateau minus P. And resistance is 
peak minus plateau divided by 12. What page is it um, I'm looking on 307 in your book. It's not chapter 9. It's, I'm looking at it from the other chapter we're working on. Um, but really, what I think why the formulas aren't on here, really why we care about this is what diseases will we see at high end? Um, so I, I won't make you do the math on this one. Um, and how do we how do we find it? Remember, airway resistance we can get from the body box, right? Mm -hmm. When it's one of those tests. When we watched him do the little test, he talks about uh, getting FRC, which then we can get our RV, um, and then we can also get resistance. So who has increases in resistance? Asthma is our poster child for that, right? All the airways are shut down. Bronchitis and emphysema can also give us those. So we see resistance issues mostly with mostly with asthma, but potentially anything that's reversible, which reverses with the bronchodilator, it's an airway issue, right? So the airways are squeezed down um, because of our uh, smooth muscle being restricted, right? Okay, so <clears throat> there again, you won't have to do the formula for this test, um, but just know that you're able to get that from your body box study. Um, compliance studies, we, can, we could get that. I think we get some of that from body box as well, um, but this one in particular is talking about getting it from a balloon, esophageal balloon. Okay, so we talked about NAVA having that, uh, <clears throat> where you can drop the esophageal uh, tube, Pro, I'm like, what's the word? Yeah, drop the esophageal pro. They use it to feed the patient as well. Um, and we can actually get those pressures across the diaphragm from that same probe. Um, and they do a lot of studies using those probes, getting those esophageal pressures. Uh, when you go to convention or when you're looking at some of those ventilator studies, uh, a lot of times one of the lines they're looking at is diaphragmatic uh, pressures as well when they're getting that from esophageal pro. Um, there again, you, you can get some compliance studies from that as well. Um, compliance, when is our compliance going to be off? ARDS is our poster child for that, so things that go along with that. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, the lungs are stiff and small. Um, pneumonia can cause problems in volume or problems in the lungs moving, and atelectasis. So static compli compliance issues usually go along with these disease, disease processes. <coughs> Okay, so resistance, asthma is our poster child, compliance, ARDS is our poster child, but anything that hardens and stiffens the lungs uh, can also kind of go in that group. Okay, this is over uh, We've seen this little slide before, looking at lung compliance. Um, and we've, we've talked about this in the vent class, right? Here's your normal compliance. If we were doing a flow volume loop, we would like it to look like football there, if they have poor compliance, they have ARDS potentially maybe, uh, our football drops, which means we have, takes more pressure to actually get some volume change um, from these stiffer lungs, right? So that's that's how we kind of use it on our vent to see um, are we going to ARDS or not. Um, but if you had a patient that already had lung fibrosis, you would see that they have poor compliance. Emphysema patients, they got these big old floppy lungs, their compliance is usually not a problem. Resistance might be a problem if they have um, airway bronchoconstriction along with it, um, but probably not. So this kind of I like this I like this slide. It kind of helps me remember what disease processes go which way. <clears throat> okay, bronchoprovocation testing. Um, when we talked about this probably a long time ago in bar when we were talking about uh, methicoline. Methicoline is the most common one that we use for this. Um, we were trying to determine asthma with this testing. Provoking agents, inhaled histamine or methicoline. Um, we try to shut them down. Methicoline is not good for your body. It's a parasympathomimetic. I mean, parasympathomimetic. Remember those parasympathomimetics? Anything parasympathetic can cause bronchoconstriction. That's why we give atrovent to block that response or atropine as well. Um, so, if they're given some methicoline, it causes them to shut down. Uh, other things that might work, exercise, and where sometimes we're trying to determine do they have exercise-induced asthma, have them run around, see if that causes them to shut down. So you would do a pre-test, have them go run, do a post-test, or do some kind of exercise. Um, cold air. When I first started at the hospital, we only did uh, cold air provocation. We didn't use methicoline. Um, they came around later and started using it, 
Um, and we were scared to death of that because we were like, what if we shut them down? We can't get them open back up. We have to call code the PFT lab. How awful would that be? And now they're doing most of the PFTs. They're not doing too many at the hospital. They're doing most of them at Zarabi's office. So now I'm like, well, what if you had to call a code at Zarabi's office? That would, they have to still wait for the ambulance to get them, take them across the street. <laughs> That's not very fun. Uh, but truthfully, we've had, I think, I was asking my friend Julie when she was doing that pulling challenge, and I was like, have you had a lot of problems? Because one time I had to send a patient down to the ER. She said he wasn't dying, we just couldn't get him to reverse out. So they had to give him some steroids. Maybe he was sick when he came, which you're not supposed to be sick when you come. Um, but she said really hadn't had any issues. So, um, so method calling is a thing. So what do we do? Uh, how does this work? We need a 20% decrease in that FEV1. Um, so we have to give them enough method calling to decrease the FEV1 by 20%. And we give them a little tiny bit at a time. So give them a little bit, have them breathe, have them do a little breathe out test. Maybe the FEV went down, went down a little, but not very much. Give them another dose. Trying to get that FEV, FEV1 to shut down by 20%. If a little tiny bit shuts them down, the very, very hyper uh, reactive airway, uh, then we give them a breathing treatment and then we do it again and see if they increase by 12%. Um, and open them back up. So it also, it depends on how much methicoline we have to give to, to get a high reactive response. So we have to give a whole bunch, we're getting toward the end of how much we would ever give a patient, um, then we would say they probably do not have a very high reactive airway. But then we, there again, we go bronchodilate and back up 12%, but this is how we get them shut down so we can open them up by 12%. Um, and, and also, if you're doing bronchoprovocation testing, or if you're just doing a regular PFT, a lot of times they are trying to determine um, if they open up with a breathing treatment. So you want to be sure you hold um, all your breathing treatments for X amount of hours. At the hospital, they do four or six hours. I think the book rec recommends like eight hours, something like that. Um, so sometimes at the hospital, if you're on fifth floor and your patient's scheduled for a PFT, um, hopefully diagnostics will contact you and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so in 472 is doing a PFT at nine, hold his 7 a.m. medication. Don't give him his morning breathing treatment. Um, so that they can give it to him while he's doing this test. So, um, <clears throat> and then before and after bronchodilators, we said the, these slides are not the, the most common number is, is going to be 12% or 200 mils for both of these. This book, this one says 10% and says 15% on that. If you know 12%, you're good to go. So 12% or 200 mils on the FEV, FVC and FEV1. And if your FEV 25, 75 increases 20 to 30%, great. Um, but that's really not a number that we're looking at closely. It's really these two. Okay, so bronchoprovocation has to shut them down by how much? 20%. And then we have to open them back up by 12% or 200 mils. Very good. And looking at Okay, so it says that the PC20 occurs at less than one milligram per mil month of colon, moderate to severe HR, AHR is present, um, which is consistent with asthma. PC20 values between 1 and 16 milligrams suggest we do not confirm a diagnosis yet. If you go above 16 milligrams per mil of that methicoline, then we say you don't have asthma. It used to be on the chart. Okay, so PC20 is what they're calling that. I don't think that's on the boards when I remember from my other class, but. Um, I don't think you have to know that. Okay, this is just 
saying, basic pre-bronchodilator and post-bronchodilator testing. Uh, I can make sure they haven't taken any bronchodilators. Um, we need three baseline FEC maneuvers, administer um, a beta agonist albuterol, wait at least 10 minutes and re repeat the spirometry. So doing a test like this is also going to be exhausting, isn't it? You got to you got to do a baseline test. Then we have to give you some methanol and do another test. So there you go, 60 seconds. Give you a little more. Do another test. Give you a little more. Finally, we get you shut down. Then we have to give you a breathing treatment. Wait 10 minutes. And then you got to do three more, showing that you're good to go afterwards. So this is a long and exhausting process for these people. So you can imagine why they need to be healthy to do this test, not having an asthma attack. Because you'll never be able to get very very far along with this. You have to stop your testing. <clears throat> okay, so 16 milligrams per mil, mm -hmm. that's our kind of our max amount on methanol. Okay, the next part is exhaled nitric oxide, FENO. So FE, you think in your mind, every time I see this, I think it's iron. And I'm like, iron in O, iron, iron nitric oxide. It's not. It's a little e, which is exhaled fraction of nitric oxide. So our bodies produce a little bit of nitric oxide uh, when we exhale. I don't know how they ever figured that out, but I think it's a pretty amazing study. Um, and the more inflammation you have, the more nitric oxide you will exhale. So if you have asthma attack and have a lot of inflammation, when they do an FENO test on you, you're going to breathe out quite a bit of nitric oxide. Um, as it gets under control, those numbers should come down. So you can use it to diagnose asthma. And I, I have <coughs> and I could not find them. Um, one of my students let me, she had problems, and she let me have, let us have a copy of her study. But I mean, it basically showed FENO really high, um, and then it showed as she took some uh, steroids, it actually dropped down a little bit. So they use it to diagnose, but a lot of times they're using it more to manage. So if you come up high, we put you on, let's say, Simbaport at the low dose. You come back two months later, you do another FENO. Your numbers are lower, but still not significantly lower. Um, so you're getting controlled, but you're not controlled yet. So we increase your Simbaport from the 80 to the 160. So that, that's, it's trying to determine uh, where are you best managed. So we can use it for diagnosis, but a lot of times we're using it for management. Um, we can assess respiratory symptoms, uh, identify eosinophilic asthma phenotype. So most asthma we see is our eosinophilic asthma. What does that mean? What's the IgE or IgE? IgE is high, and when we draw blood, we see eosinophils on that white blood cell count. Those eosinophils are really high, right? That's usually a hyperreactive response. Like allergic asthma. Allergic, yeah, exactly, or allergic asthma, right? Um, so FENO kind of puts you in that group. If your NO is high, then we say you probably have eosinophilic asthma. Um, and then we're looking at response to treatment. Pretty simple procedure, it's very flow dependent. Your patient has to try really hard, so it's also uh, patient dependent on if they can do the test or not. Uh, patients should be seated comfortably when they're doing the test. Use no, no slips if they cannot avoid nasal breathing heavy. Avoid any breath holding preceding the test maneuver. Have them exhale normally without the mouthpiece. Inhale in O free air through the mouth, mouthpiece for two to three seconds to control the lung capacity. So you gotta have something to get all the NO out of the air. Uh, maintain steady low expiratory flow for at least six seconds or four seconds for children. And they do this, uh, my student that did it, she did it at her uh, allergist office. That's where they did this test. Um, so, you gotta get your little kids to breathe out for four seconds. I mean, we all know it's hard to breathe for six seconds um, as an adult. You gotta get the little kids to breathe out for four seconds. It's a long time. I feel like, on a little kid, I feel like you'd have to do this test so many times to actually get an accurate result. Um, but terminate the maneuver once the test is deemed acceptable, um, and then do a 30 second interval between those procedures. So this kind of tells you how to do it. There again, pretty easy test. Um, this is showing three different pretests, um, all pretty repeatable and acceptable, right? Um, with this parts per billion is 15. Does it have a cutoff on parts per billion? Um,
what, what brought that up to my mind was looking at this chart. It said, consider other causes of symptoms if they're less than 25, such as sinusitis, are they having irritation from drainage from their head, COPD, GERD, GERD is a big cause of asthma, remember that, um, from studying that, um, especially in older, older people uh, that grow, grow into asthma and they don't know why. Um, once they take care of their GERD, a lot of times the asthma goes away. So, lots of problems. Um, and then anxiety. Okay, exercise testing. <clears throat> this can be a lot of different there's a lot of different ways to do this exercise testing, but as far as the book is looking at just simple six minute walk tests. You guys have probably seen those or done those. Has anybody done a six minute walk test at the hospital? I've seen it. With the patients, okay. So EKG Tech does those sometimes. Um, uh, you've done them? Yeah. yeah. So they're pretty easy. They, they've ordered them, they order them weirdly on patients. And I think there's some idea out there that in order to qualify for HOMO 2, they have to do a six minute walk test. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. You only have to show that you drop below 87, uh, drop below 88. Um, if you're exercising, no, it's really supposed to be at rest, but there is a case you can make for exercising and dropping below when you're exercising as well. But it doesn't have to necessarily be six minutes, a six minute walk test. Um, but they, they order them all the time, and I'm like, they, they, they're confused about how the, I think it's how insurance is going to pay. And I think that they all think that insurance won't pay unless you order a six-minute walk test and do a six-minute walk test. A six-minute walk test is literally just to see endurance, just to see if you're doing better than you were before. So if you go through uh, pulmonary rehab, your six-minute walk test will probably be better. Um, and they're just testing endurance. When you go watch at Zerati's office, a lot of times, um, when I've been at my doctor's office, who used to be right next door, um, I would see Bobby, she did the PFTs, she worked for Zerati's office. I see her out there walking around with patients, <laughs> monitoring them, like, what are you doing? She goes, I was doing my six minute walk test. So it's, it's really a test of endurance to see if they're actually doing better or worse. Can they work further or walk further? Are they doing, they would do a few stairs maybe. So they're testing endurance, which is a great thing to do. But as far as, as far as qualifying your patient for HOMO 2, it doesn't necessarily need to do to be a six minute walk test. So um, somebody got confused on that and they just keep doing it. And so we end up doing six minute walk tests unnecessarily a lot of times. Um, okay, so exercise testing, assessment of your patient's exercise capacity or its effect on body functions. Um, tests range from a simple evaluation of exercise tolerance, such as our six minute walk, to complex protocols requiring concurrent assessment of cardiovascular, pulmonary and metabolism measures. Um, they used to do a little more testing on this, but they pretty well pulled it, pulled it out now. Um, nobody's told me that they had any test questions about metabolism or anything like that on the board, so we're not gonna get real in depth about it. But you see, um, you see sports figures running on a treadmill with a mask on. They're measuring that XLCO2, and that is uh, used in all these metabolism studies to figure out um, how in shape they are, basically. So that is kind of the other way far end. So we basically do our little six minute walk test, or we can get you on a treadmill and measure all these things, or we can uh, have you ride a bike and measure these things as well. Um, they don't do those studies here very often. I think you have to go to Dallas and a big PFT lab where they would do those types of things, or maybe be an athlete now. Um, so our basic six minute walk test <coughs> measures how far a patient can walk in this specified time. If you're doing six minute walk test, um, these are the things that you need to be writing down. Uh, have them sit and rest for a little bit, get your equipment, which is just gonna be a stopwatch, board scale just says how short a breath are you, um, and then write everything down. With patient resting, gather the needed demographic data and record the vital signs. Um, if we're monitoring the stat, be sure we get a baseline. Uh, have a patient stand, tell us about his dyspnea. This is the position of the patient at the start line. That's like <laughs> <laughs> And then put them in those blocks. Um, as soon as the patient starts to walk, we start timing them. Um, when you've done one lap or gone down the back, um, you want to just say, how are you doing? <laughs> at exactly six minutes, firmly say, stop. 
and place a marker at the stopping point. Do you do that, Autumn? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> that's constantly running. So somebody is watching the EKG looking for changes. Also measuring blood pressure. Uh, there again, super hard to measure blood pressure when someone's running fast on the treadmill. And you have to be like, I am totally making up this blood pressure. I had to do that once and I hadn't taken up blood pressure for like five years. And I'm like, yeah, I'll help with the stress testing. And I'm like thinking, okay, how do you take blood pressure? Um, so I took it and I got it down and then they started walking on that thing. And I'm like, okay, I don't think I can hear this very well. And I'm like watching the needle bump. And I'm like, okay, 120 over 80. <laughs> that is, they're getting faster and they're walking faster. It's louder and louder. I'm still, I'm like, I totally can't hear this. And I was like, ooh, it's about 130 over 85. And the doctor goes, they're all about, Lori. <laughs> Finally, after they're like literally running, I'm like, I can't hear it. I can't hear anything. And he's like, it's okay. I, I, don't, I wouldn't expect you to. I'm like, well, I wish I had known that before I was making all those other ones up. <laughs> and I really have no idea what her blood pressure is. I'm pretty sure it's high. I was like, okay, I'm not going to take these anymore. He goes, that's fine. And plus, also, if you can run on a treadmill, you're probably doing pretty good. And he wasn't seeing any changes over there, but still. Yeah, so it is tricky. So if you volunteer to work in the stress test area, um, be sure you practice taking a blood pressure. And if you flat can't hear anything, just tell them because when I was just making them up. I'm sure he knew I couldn't hear them. After he's like, yeah, I doubt you can hear them. I'm like, cramp, I just want to make them up. He's calling me out, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I didn't think you could hear that last or you told me for But um, anyway, so if you have a, you could use the, I don't even think, a little machine, what do you call it? You would have to keep pushing on. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think it would pick it up very well either. Yeah, you have to, but I think if the patient's moving, it's not, you know, it's not going to be an accurate number anyway. So, yeah, I'm not sure why we even try to do that as a patient trying to run a treadmill. But, um, but I have to say, my brother-in-law had a treadmill stress test, and the, the way they knew he was having problems was because blood pressure got really high. And I don't know if they could tell it during the test or after the test, um, but they were like, yeah, your blood pressure is a little high to start with. Went really, really high, so they stopped the test, and yeah, they ended up having Quadruple bypass. Um, so, I mean, he had a history of heart disease, but anyway. So, yeah, that made me think, wow, I totally should have made up higher numbers when I was doing those. Next time I'll, I'll go a little higher than my 130 over 80. Um, 
Mm-hmm. All right, so we can tell coronary artery disease, risk and prognosis in patients with a history. Um, have they gotten worse? Have they gotten better? Things like that. Uh, prognosis after an MI, if your patient's had an MI recently, obviously they're going to want a treadmill. Um, but if they've had one a ways back, we might do a treadmill stress test. Um, looking at patients, heart patients' activity, or if we're thinking about going to pulmonary rehab or cardiac rehab, uh, we might need to baseline treadmill stress test. Um, and then looking at is medicine working or not. <clears throat> okay, so looking at this, I, I think there might be a test on a test question on this. Um, it's not really hard. I, on the packet that I gave you guys, there was a paper on the back that talked about that. This um, VO2 max, that's the maximal uptake of O2 per minute at peak exercise capacity. There again, this is where they're having you breathe in one of those little things in order to get these numbers. Um, so typical values at peak exercise capacity. Um, this says your men, 35 to 90 mils per kilogram per minute. Women, 25 to 75 mils per kilogram per minute. Um, then anaerobic threshold, this is exercise intensity beyond which progressive increases in blood lactate occur. So we know that. When you are running and you start getting cramps or the side stitch, that's because you've gone anaerobic. You don't have enough oxygen, um, so you're building up lactic acid. Blood lactate levels build up, and that's related to um, decreased oxygen for various reasons, but when you're exercising, it's because you're not breathing, not able to get oxygen where it needs to go fast enough. Even though you feel like you're breathing to beat the band, it's still, when you're in really poor shape, it's not getting where it needs to go very well. Um, and then HR max, maximum heart rate at peak exercise, uh, 220 minus your age, and they recommend you exercise at what, 85% of max. So 220 minus your age times 0.85 kind of gives you an idea of where you should be exercising, the max number you should be exercising at. Um, so basically what this tells us is, if your patient's VO2 max is really high, that means they're using a lot of oxygen. So it can't be just because they're out of shape if you were doing, your, doing that little paper which you're bringing. Um, that, that can be normal, the O2 max being high can be normal. Um, but looking at anaerobic threshold, if your cardiac issues, if your patient's having cardiac issues, um, probably anaerobic threshold goes high. Uh, also looking at breathing reserve, if they're having pulmonary issues, breathing reserve is going to be greater than 30%. Um, looking at SAT and then oxygen consumption, that's just looking at uh, oxygen consumption per heartbeat. I don't even know. I don't remember how they figured that one. Um, but the, the little paper that I gave you is probably that would be the way it might look on the test. That's from Kettering. He only has like a one one little section about it, um, and basically he just kind of divides it out, which says the O2 max can be high with anybody. Breathing reserve is high. It's a pulmonary problem. Uh, cardiac reserve is high. Uh, then it's a then it's a cardiac problem. So you know that information, that's enough to get you on your boards. If you work in the lab where you're doing this type of testing, uh, you're gonna have to know way more about this anyway, and they would have to train you on this. Uh, as far as what you're gonna do in most of your respiratory lab, you're not gonna be doing a whole lot of this. And most of the people I think that work in these labs, not be respiratory therapists, my guess is they're exercise science majors um, that know how to do all of this uh, now, which we don't, and nor do we need to. Um, so, if you know the little chart, you're fine for boards and you're fine for this test. All right. Was it a packet that you were talking about? Uh, yeah, it had the, uh, it was like six pages. Did I get a glass in Chapter 17, chapter 18. I mean, question, question 17, question 18. 
The first one is about uh, reversal airway obstruction, and these are just examples uh, that I found for these types of questions. Um, so the second one there, question 18, um, it says, based on the results of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which of the following patients most likely has a ventilatory limit to exercise? Um, and I picked patient A, which was wrong when I did this. Um, it's actually patient D. <clears throat> so in looking at the uh, information at the bottom, it says, all patients with poor exercise capacity have a reduced like VO2 max. Points. So if your patient has a... Samantha doesn't have this one. I can't find it whenever you... I was looking for it that day I asked you. Okay, I put it on Blackboard. Okay. So you can print it out. I, I would, you can just look on the chart if you want. I only found the big packet for her. Yeah, I, Brandon told me and I put it on Blackboard, but I don't... guess I told you that I put it on Blackboard. <laughs> it's on there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and if you want to stay after and go over any of this, we can. Okay. To be sure you understand that. Um, Okay, so it says all patients with poor exercise have a reduced VO2 max, which is oxygen consumption. In addition, patients with a pulmonary limitation to exercise tend to have a normal anaerobic threshold, um, but a decreased breathing reserve. So pulmonary breathing makes sense, right? Breathing reserve is low. Patients with a cardiovascular limitation to exercise typically have a reduced anaerobic threshold, uh, but a normal breathing reserve. In the presence of a low VO2 max, poor effort is revealed by both a normal anaerobic threshold and a normal breathing reserve. So if you're looking up here and the question was a ventilatory limitation to exercise, we're looking for a decreased breathing reserve, right? And when you look across there, breathing reserve decreased is D. Um, anaerobic threshold is normal. It could, it could be changed as well. Uh, and VO2 max, they said everybody that has anaerobic or breathing or just in poor shape can have a decreased VO2 max. So VO2 max is not going to tell you pulmonary or cardiac. You got to look over a breathing reserve to determine if you're pulmonary and cardiac or just pulmonary or just cardiac. Does that make sense? So breathing, pulmonary, anaerobic, cardiac, VO2 max, both, and anybody who's in bad shape. To me, I may have a decreased VO2 max, probably a decreased anaerobic threshold. I think my breathing reserve would probably be decreased as well. I'd probably be just decreased across the board and they'll be like, you're in such bad shape, we can't even really tell what your reserves are. All right. Okay, so we did a little paper on trials, right? Which one was acceptable, repeatable, all of that. You'll see something like that. Uh, we did, this is just looking at uh, Effort, these were just looking at effort and repeatability as well, kind of something similar to that. Might see something related to reserve. We're gonna see something related to that 12% increase on our um, uh, bronchodilator response. Um, you'll see questions related to inspiratory capacity is equal to blah, blah, blah. Um, adding those things together, so draw your box. Um, you'll see questions about um, just interpretation in general, like from those case studies. So there'll be quite a few of those. All right. So you've gone over everything that you would see on the test. I know it's a lot of information. PFTs are, are a lot, but it, answering your, you answering when I ask a question, you say that with a pretty good hold on it. Uh, I think bottom line is do you know those norms? Right? So less than 70% on the FEV1 to FVC tells you obstructive. FEV1 or FVC less than 80 tells us we have restrictive and more restrictive going on. Uh, bronchodilator has to go up by 12% uh, or 200 bells. <coughs> Bronchoprovocation, you got to drop them by 20%. FVNO, cut off less than 25, you're good. 50 or more, you're in big trouble. Um, that's the most, those are the most common kind of number of things that we need to know. All right, equations, math equations, did you ever There won't be, there's not flat out math equations, that's more on the um, critical care, you know, to where you have to actually do the equations will be on critical care. Um, the things that you might be asked, which test would give you airway resistance? Body pump, pump ismography, right? That also would give you compliance studies, right? So what does the body box give us? So the questions like that. What, t what test would you do on your patient to get um, uh, total lung capacity or 
yeah, took TLC um, if you were in a small, tiny little hospital somewhere. Huh? Spirometry won't give you TLC, right? Remember, we have to do those static compliance tests, which are, there's three in that category. Helium dilution, nitrogen washout, or body box. Small, tiny hospital, not going to have a body box or body plug tomography, so it's going to probably have to be helium dilution and nitrogen washout. That, it'll be those types of questions. What are these tests telling us? What test would you use to find this in the Also, gave you uh, the handout from Kettering that has oh, also these little uh, these little flow volume things. So I've given you the handout from Kettering. Makes things pretty easy to understand. I would definitely read through that. It gives you some real good cutoff numbers. Um, he does a good job of kind of lining things up that way. All right. Next class is going to be chapter 14. Are we getting a little break? <coughs> yeah, going to break.